if you look at the passage creativity is a uh, characteristics is a trait which is supposed to tell you about your skills about what you can create you can be original and uh, this entire passage is about creativity the hurdles in creativity and what possibly fosters creativity what possibly encourages creativity if you look at the first paragraph he raises a question there what posters creativity he says more than anything else the presence of other creative people that is if you are you see among creative people then you yourself become creative and it is a false belief he says creativity is only the prerogative or the field of people who are individual geniuses he says creativity is a social process our biggest creative breakthroughs come when people learn from compete with and collaborate with other you see creativity has its source in social interaction in competition in cooperation creativity is not supposed to be the birthright of certain intelligent people that is what the author says in the second paragraph he will talk about cities and when he says cities he says that cities you see they are the sources of true creativity because you have a dense population social networks public spaces you see where people can meet and talk and chat and gossip they might come up with new things new proposals new plans and third paragraph he says it is ironical ironical what that what staunches creativity what blocks creativity what is the impediment to creativity the very institutions the very people uh, the very social uh, interaction you see which is supposed to encourage creativity sometimes they block create why because he says creativity is disruptive schools and organizations are regimented standardized and stultified schools and organizations you have to be within regimentation you have to be within discipline and if you are within discipline if you have to adjust yourself all the time to some kind of discipline then your creativity suffers so even in social interactions if you are taught well this is how you should speak this is how you should sit down this is how you should get up then your creativity you see suffers you have a paragraph the education expert what he says percentages and all those things there urban is jane jacobs you see she calls them such people as squelchers you see squelchers uh, who interfere with creativity in the last paragraph Uh, creativity is not in danger it's flourishing around us in science technology arts and culture in our rapidly revitalizing time to build a truly creative society he says we have got to go a long way okay let's come to the questions now and the first question is in the author's view cities promote human creativity for all the following reason except that they have the first point is given in paragraph to uh, the public spaces where people can meet expose people to different and novel ideas because this is mentioned in the first paragraph provide financial and institutional networks that enable ideas to become reality the first two paragraphs talk about these things so what isn't mentioned is provide access to cultural activities that promote new and creative ways of thinking this is the answer number 4 now let's come to the next question the author uses ironic in the third paragraph to point out what you see what staunches creativity it's ironic the very institutions that we build they block you see creativity and he pointed out how because of discipline regimentation people need social contact rather than isolation no number 2 is the answer institutions created to promote creativity eventually stifle it eventually block it the third question says the central idea of the passage is that obviously the first one social interaction is necessary to nurture creativity uh, he has made it very clear right in the first paragraph and he talks about in the second and third paragraph if you want creativity you must have social interaction creativity ideas are gradually declining in all societies that is not the point the creativity divide is widening in societies in line with socio economic trends that may be a point but that isn't a central point more people should work in jobs that engage their creative faculty that is only a suggestion now the next question is jane jacobs believed that cities that are more creative all cities she said filled with creative people that's our default state as people but some cities had more than their share of leaders people and institution that blocked out creativity the answer is number 3 jane jacobs believed that cities that are more creative 
have leaders and institutions that do not block green. And then the next one is the 1968 study is used here to show what. It shows schooling today does not encourage creative thinking in children. You see, by the time we are adults, our creativity has been wrung out of us. So creativity is a casualty use. When the children were between three and five years old, 98% achieved positive scores. And then eight to 10, only 32% passed the same test and only 10% at 13 to 15 and finally if they, when they were adults all creativity was wrung out of them now the next thing is authors conclusions about the most creative cities in the u.s are based on his assumption that what is the assumption people who work with their hands are not doing creative work the last line of this paragraph that leaves a group that i term the other 66 person who toil in low wage vote and rotten jobs if they have jobs at all in which their creativity is subjugated, ignored or wasted. You have a passage here and it is called sub Nevium, small area between the snowpack and the ground. The subnevium becomes a microclimate where the temperature stays stable slightly higher than 32 degrees. He's talking about the survival of people, the insulation you see of people within the subnevium or for that matter any animal. He begins with the frigid uh, season, with the winter, talks about you see nestling and may keeping yourself warm and it could be sometimes between 30 and 40 degrees warmer than air temperature during the peak of winter a wide variety of species depend on the subnevium for winter protection disruptions to the subnevium brought about by climate change will affect everything from population dynamics to nutrients cycling through the ecosystem eight inches of snow is necessary to develop a stable layer of insulation the stability of the subnevium depends on the interaction between the snow depth and the snow density. Imagine being under a stack of blankets that are all flattened and pressed together. When compressed, the blankets essentially form one compacted layer. In contrast, when they are lightly placed on top of one another, their insulative capacity increases because the air pockets between them trap heat. Greater depths of low density snow are therefore better at insulating the ground and then of course he talks about the depth and density of snow being sensitive to temperature and of course scientists are now trying to find out the climate change that will affect the subnevium and also the species you see that depend upon them the last paragraph he talks about the effects of a colder subnevium are complex uh, shrubs and crowberry and alpine alzea you see the plants that grow along the forest floor tend to block the wind and retain higher depths of snow around them this captured snow helps to keep soils insulated and in turn increases plant decomposition and nutrient release in field experiments researchers removed a portion of the snow covered they found that the soil frost in snow free area you see that is responsible for the death of the plants the purpose of this passage is to i think it should be number three is to outline the effects of climate change on the subnevium scientists are now beginning to explore how climate change will affect the subnevium as well as the species that depend on it uh, the next one is all of the following statements are true snow depth and snow density both influence the stability of the subnevium we know that three says the subnevium maintains a stable temperature between 30 and 40 degrees you have that in paragraph number two that's true researchers have established the adverse effect of dwindling snow cover on the subnevium you have that what is not given is uh, except climate change has some positive effects on the subnevium he doesn't talk about all these things based on this extract the author would support which one of the following actions number one would he suppose the use of snow machines in winter to ensure snow cover of at least eight inches now that would be very absurd adding nutrients to the soil in winter how would that help planting more shrubs in areas of short snow season uh, no in fact he would like a government action to climate change to curb climate change in paragraph six author provides the example of crowberry and alpine azalea to demonstrate what he says that the shrubs such as crowberry and alpine azalea that grew along the forest floor 
tend to block wind and so retain higher depths of snow around them. This captured snow helps to keep the soil insulated, etc. He wants to de demonstrate that's given in number four. The stability of the subnivium depends on several interrelated factors, including shrubs on the forest floor. Uh, he doesn't want to demonstrate number one, that is, despite frigid temperatures, several species survive in temperate and arctic. He's not talking about that. Due to frigid temperatures in the temperate and arctic regions, plant species that survive tend to be shrubs rather than trees. No, he hasn't posited such debates, you see, that who is going to survive and which plant is going to survive or which isn't. Uh, the crowberry and alpine azillas are abundant in temperate and arctic regions. And I don't think the entire passage is about that. The next one is, which one of the following statements can be inferred from the passage? It may not be given in the passage because an inference is generally not stated or even it is stated, it is implicitly stated. It is not barely stated, openly stated. The loss of subnivium while tragic will affect only temperate and arctic regions. Uh, it's not that. That's not the point he's making here. A compact layer of wool is warmer than a similarly compact layer of goose down. Uh, now, goose down is goose feather. Uh, D-O-W-N down means feather. It is a poetic term. You can't have a, such an absurd inference. Climate change affects temperate and arctic regions more than equatorial or arid ones. No. The answer is first, in an ecosystem, altering any one element has a ripple effect on others. That is the thing. In an ecosystem, everything has to be balanced. You see. The next is, in paragraph one, the author uses blankets as a device. Evoke the bitter cold of winter in the minds of readers. No. Explain how blankets work to keep us warm. No. Draw an analogy between blankets and the snowpack. That is the correct answer. Alert readers to the fatal effects of excessive exposure to the cold. No, that is not the purpose of use of blankets there. Now, next one. Electric vehicles are a fashion these days. Uh, look at the very first sentence. The end of the age of the internal combustion engine is in sight. In fact, he's making possibly a prediction or something. And he says, look at the last line of the first paragraph. This is a remarkable figure for a machine with a fairly short range and a very limited number of specialized charging stations. In spite of that, people are opting for electric vehicles. The second paragraph, uh, he talks about uh, Elon Musk, the founder, the salesman. The engineer admiring Elon Musk in the third line, he said the private car is a device of immense practical health and economic significance, but at the same time, a theater for myths of unattainable self-fulfillment. The one thing you will never see in a car advertisement is the traffic, even though that is the element in which drivers spend their lives. Every single driver in a traffic jam is trying to escape from it, yet it is the inevitable consequence of mass car ownership. Uh, well, why does he give an example of this kind? It is a symbolic example. Car, you see, symbolizes what you haven't yet achieved in life. And by owning a car, you would be achieving all those things. All the traffic. Now, the traffic symbolizes our thoughts, our minds, our ambitions, which are all confused and in a chaotic state. But then in a car advertisement, they don't show you the traffic because they want to tell you symbolically that once you possess a car, you get rid of all this traffic of thoughts, you see. In the next paragraph also, the very first line, he is talking about the fantasy of autonomy and power. And of course, electrical cars would be less polluting compared to petrol-driven cars. And look, he says the dream goes further than that. The electric cars of the future will be so thoroughly equipped with sensors and reaction mechanisms that they will never hit anyone. Just as brakes don't let you skid today, the steering wheel of tomorrow will swerve you away from the danger before you even notice. The electric vehicle may not be even driven by a driver. It may be on its own. Look at the last paragraph, the first line. This is where the fantasy of autonomy comes full circle. The logical outcome of cars which need no driver is that they will become cars which need no owner either. Instead, they will work as taxis do some at will but only for the journeys we actually need this 
the future towards which uber is working the ultimate development of the private car will reinvent public transport traffic jams will be abolished only when the private car becomes a public utility what then will happen to our fantasies of independence we will all have to take electrically powered bicycle. Which one of the following statements best reflects the author's argument? Answer is number three. The private car represents an unattainable myth of independence. He's talking about uh, throughout the entire passage. He talks about hybrid and electrical vehicles signal the end of the age of... That is a point in passing he makes at the beginning. Elon Musk is a remarkably gifted uh, salesman. No, he's not talking about Elon Musk in the whole passage. Uh, the future Uber car will environmentally friendly the, even the Tesla. No, that is not the point. Uh, all that is described here is about possessing a car and what it represents. The next one, the author points out all of the following about electric cars except the last one. They will ultimately undermine rather than further driver autonomy. The driver autonomy uh, will not be furthered it will be undermined. According to the author, the main reason for Tesla's remarkable sales is that people believe in the autonomy represented by private cars. In the long run, the Tesla is more cost effective. The US government has announced tax subsidy. The company is rapidly upscaling the number of no, the passage doesn't say talk about all these things. The author comes to the conclusion that car drivers will no longer own cars but will have to use public transport. Uh, cars will be controlled by technology that is more efficient than car drivers. Car drivers uh, dream of autonomy, but the future may be public transport. That is the point. Autonomy is independent. The tone of the passage seems to be ironic. And if the tone of the passage is ironic, uh, the last sentence you see may appear to be correct, but it isn't. People owning cars and then switching over to electrically powered bicycles. So that cannot be the answer. The next one, in paragraphs 5 and 6, the author provides the example of Uber to argue what? In the future, the private car will be transferred into a form of public transport. The next question, in paragraph 6, the author mentions electrically powered bicycles to argue that. And that's number two. Our fantasies of autonomy might unexpectedly require us to consider electric bicycles. See, that's why I said it's ironic. Because he uses the word unexpectedly require us. Now, if Alan Musk were a true visionary, he would invest funds in developing electrical bicycles. He wouldn't do that. That is a circulatory argument going about and about. In terms of environmental friendliness and safety, electrical bicycles rather than electric cars are the future. Uh, he doesn't argue that. Electric buses are the best form of public transport. He doesn't talk about that anywhere in the passage. We have a passage about typewriting here. What he is doing in this passage is he is trying to tell us uh, the importance of the typewriter. Typewriter, once upon a time, had been all important. And it's still now, you see, important. The coming of the digital age, which he talks about in the first line, we have done away with the typewriters that they have become obsolete and they have become old and uh, because of their weight the ribbon would sometimes get stuck or the carriage would get stuck there was some privacy about the typewriter not everyone could possibly uh, look at what you are typing or see what you have typed it was your personal private affair As he says a typewriter you see uh, demands a lot of attention your thinking process has to be parallel with what you are typing if you have got to do so many things on a typewriter you set the margins you set the carriage and uh, you know you should know that you are hitting the right key so that it was uh, no doubt a difficult task you see the typewriter but it was more personal you see he points out a very good thing you see in the last three lines there can be no thinking on screen with the typewriter because you don't have a screen there and you think and then you type and the thinking process is accompanied by the encouraging clack of keys and the ratchet of the carriage return the ratchet is the sound you see when the carriage returns it has the music of its own now let's come to the questions which one of the following best describes what the passage is trying to do the last one it shows that computers offer fewer options than typewriters uh, that's not in the passage you see of, of course the computer offers you more options it highlights the personal benefits of the using typewriters 
no it argues that typewriters will continue to be used even though they are an obsolete technology no he doesn't argue that the first one is the answer it describes why people continue to use typewriters even in digital age yes now we come to the next question according to the passage some governments still use typewriters because they don't want to share the document you see with everyone they can control who reads the document so number 4 is the correct answer now let's come to the next question the writer praises typewriters for all the following reasons except unlike computers they can only be used for typing no twitter no online shopping no urgent emails no distractions so that is correct he praises that you cannot revise what you have typed on a typewriter yes that's correct he has already said that once you have typed then you cannot revise it you have to keep an alert mind uh, he says this means sorting of ideas pulling together a kind of order uh, organizing details before actually striking off a typewriter demands attentiveness that cannot be the answer typewriters are noisier than computers that's correct i told you there is a particular music you see that emits out of the typewriter and the last one typewriters are messier to use than computers that is the exception you have got to prepare yourself a lot you have to pay attention to the ribbon to the carriage to the movement to the margin you have to set everything and now we come to the next passage about the viking age the viking they were treated as plunderers in in fact they were plunderers robbers pirates and pillagers despite their fierce reputation vikings may not have always been the plunderers and pillagers popular culture imagine them to be now he talks about you see the combs carved from animal antlers and raw antler material has turned up at three archaeological sites in Denmark in the middle paragraph where Laura Giggle reports you see in life science that a molecular analysis was conducted and then they uh, looked into it what was the combs made of what was the other material in that you see there's going to detail on these things The fact that the animals shed their antlers also made them easy to collect uh, from the large herds of that inhabit Norway. He is trying to just decide the date on the basis of the artifact, the date about the artifacts, and also about uh, the coming of the uh, Norse. He says since the artifacts were found in marketplace areas at each side, it's more likely that the Norsemen came to trade rather than pillage. Most of the artifacts also date to 780s, but some are 725, and uh, that predates the beginning of the Viking. rates on great britain by about 70 years that is an important thing you see so you can't uh, always treat the vikings people as plunderers or people who raid the archaeologists to believe that the vikings you see had long maritime experience uh, sea voyage experience combs you see were a popular industry in scandinavia as well uh, it's possible that the antler combs represent a large trade network where the norsemen supplied raw material to craftsmen in denmark and elsewhere now let's come to the question the primary purpose of the passage is to explain the presence of reindeer antler combs in denmark no that is only a passing example to contradict the widely accepted beginning date for the viking age in britain and propose an alternate one he might propose you see an alternate one no doubt he is talking about 780s and 725 and the 70 years that predates the beginning of the viking raids he is talking about that but that is not the main purpose to challenge the popular perception of vikings as raiders by using evidence that suggests their early trade relations with europe you see that is the correct answer the very first sentence of the passage despite their fierce reputation vikings may not have always been the plunderers and pillagers popular culture imagined them to be the next question is the evidence most of the artifacts 780s but some are as old as 725 has been used in the passage to argue that the beginning date of the viking age should be changed from 793 to 725 no he's not arguing that the viking raid started as early as 725 no that is not the aim some of the antler art in fact found in denmark and great britain could have come from scandinavia but that is not the point that is made in the passage the viking trade relations with europe predates the viking raids that's what he has pointed out the next one is 
All of the following hold true for Vikings, except Vikings brought reindeer from Norway to Denmark for trade purposes. Number one, uh, before be becoming the raiders of Northern Europe, Vikings had trade relations with European nations. Uh, that is correct. You have that in the very first line. Antler cones regarded by the Vikings as a symbol of good health were a part of Viking culture. That's also given in the passage. Vikings once upon a time had trade relations with Denmark and Scandinavia. Of course, you have that in the passage. What is not true? Vikings brought reindeer from Norway to Denmark for trade purposes. Uh, reindeer can be used both as singular and plural. That's why he's saying, given that reindeer don't live, he's using a plural verb in Denmark. Uh, the researchers posited that it arrived on Viking ships from Norway. Then uh, you have a reference point. Uh, with it, 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 it cannot refer to the reindeer because reindeer is used in a plural sense here. Uh, it cannot refer to antlers because uh, that is again what you call a plural. Uh, at the most, it can, uh, you see, refer to the other material you see. So in that sense, uh, you cannot have number one as correct. Decide on the proper sequence of the order of sentences and key in the sequence of the numbers as your answer. You see, lightning starts a series of chemical reactions that need to happen to nitrogen. The chemical reactions are due to the uh, lightning. So in that sense, your first sentence should be number five. One of the most dramatic examples in nature of ill wind that blows goodness is lightning. There's an idiom in English which says, an ill wind blows nobody any good. Now, this is exactly the opposite, you see, of that idiom. You see, the one of the dramatic examples is in nature is of ill wind that blows goodness, you see, is lightning. And what is the goodness? and nitrogen, which provides nourishment, nutrient to plants. And then number three, uh, again has reference to lightning, you see. Lightning starts the series of chemical reactions that need to happen to nitrogen, ultimately helping it nourish our earth. And then he tells you about nitrogen, that nitrogen, an essential food for plants, is an abundant resource with about 22 million tons of it floating over each square mile of earth. And then you have number two. Why? Because in number two, it refers to nitrogen. In its aerial form, nitrogen is insoluble, unusable, and in, is in need of transformation. And the last one, of course, is before plants can take life from atmosphere, nitrogen must undergo transformations similar to the ones that food undergoes in our digestive machine. So the correct order should be 5, 3, 4, 2, 1. Now, let us come to the next one. Uh, he is talking about the placebo effect. It is a kind of treatment. For instance, somebody uh, has a problem and the doctor gives him, you see, certain pills made out of sugar. And the man doesn't know. He takes the medicine uh, thinking that it's a very important medicine and he gets on well also. Uh, because there is some kind of psychology involved there. You can't say, start the sentence with this has huge implications because you don't know what this refers to. And number three, the placebo effect is not solely based on believing in treatment. And the next is that the mind has the power to trigger biochemical changes. These are all further explanations for the placebo effect. He introduces the placebo effect to us in number two. He says the placebo effect is when an individual's medical condition condition or pain shows signs of improvement based on a fake intervention that has been presented to them as a real one and used to be regularly dismissed by researchers as a psychological effect. Now you have the idea of the researchers is number two, which is carried in this number five. Placebo effects are now studied not just as foils for real intervention, but as a potential portal into self-healing powers of the form. After five, that the mind has the power to trigger chemical changes, biochemical changes, because the individual believes that a given drug or intervention will be effective could empower chronic patients through the notion of our body's capacity for self-healing. Clue is self-healing because you have that clue self-healing powers of the body in number five. And the same thought is carried on in number four. The next thing is the placebo effect is not solely based on believing in treatment. However, the clinical setting in which treatments are administered is also paramount. So now he talks about uh, the placebo effect. It's not uh, based on the belief in the treatment but also on the 
clinical setting you see in which treatments are administered. This has huge implication for the healthcare system as it operates today. Now you can have number one. So uh, the final answer would be two, five, four, three, one. Now let us come to another cluster of sentences here. He's talking about Dr. Johnson who brought out the first dictionary in English. If you go by the chronology, then you should have number four as the first. The 18th century English reader in the new global world and global trade and warfare needed a dictionary with authoritative acts of definition and so forth. After number four, you have number three. Samuel Johnson was a pioneer who raised common sense to heights of genius. Now he is introducing us to the person who wrote that dictionary. The next one is the Johnson who challenged Bishop Berkeley's solipsist theory of non-existence of matter by kicking a large stone is the same Johnson for whom language must have been a brilliant. That's number five. Solipsism has to do with selfishness. And then after four, three, five, you are number one. Uh, Johnson treated English very practically as a living language with many different shades of meaning and adopted his definitions on the principle of English common law, so forth. And then last is number two, masking a profound intent. And Johnson uh, he compiled the words, the precise analog of his character. So the final answer would be four, three, five, one, two. Now, let's come to the next one. If you read through all of them, you can't start with number four. The implications of retelling stories, hence, you can't start. You see, hence, that means an argument was there already. So we should start with number two. And number two says the stories we tell reflect the world around us. And then the next one is as soon as we capture a story, the world we were trying to capture has changed. Because the point of retelling hasn't started. For the point is telling the story. After five, you have the idea of retelling. We cannot help but retell the stories that we value. After all, they are never quite right for us in our time. So you have two, five, three, and then you have four, which is the connected thought with three. And that's why he is using A and D end. And even if we manage to get them quite right, get them what? Get the story. And the last one is uh, the implications of retelling Indian stories hence takes on a new meaning in a modern India. So you have two, five, three, four, one. And then you have four alternate summaries for some of the passages here. You have to be very careful about when you look at summaries. Uh, the summary should contain everything in it. It can do away with statistics. It can do away with what you call details and uh, dates and uh, what time and all these things. But it should contain the kernel of the entire passage the central idea of the entire path. Now, in this passage, he's talking about an insect, which is the walnut swings moth. And it has an alarm system. It whistles. The uh, bird, you see, tries to go and catch that uh, caterpillar. But then as soon as the bird, you see, uh, goes near, those insects, they produce whistles uh, that sound like bird alarm calls. And uh, birds, you see, they fly away. They get scared. So that is the main point, you see, that he's making here. Uh, the best summary is in number three. The North American walnut springs moth caterpillars in a case of acoustic deception. Look, look at the word he's using, acoustic deception. That is, you deceive someone by the use of sound. Produce whistles that mimic bird alarm calls to defend them. Now, all the points are covered. The number one, acoustic deception. Number two, produce whistles. Number three, mimic bird alarm calls. Number four to defend them. Now, are these four points to be found in one, two, and four? They are not found. And if they are found, then one of them are missing. Now, we come to the next question about Socrates. Socrates came up with the uh, Socratic method of asking questions. It was a dialogic method. The teacher questions and the student answers or the student questions and the teacher answers. You see, there's an argument involved there. Now, if you go through the whole thing, Number four summarizes the whole thing very well. Both Socrates and Bacon advocated, number one, examining arguments and theories from both sides to prove. If you say both Socrates and Bacon advocated confirming arguments, no, it's not found in the passage. Advocated challenging arguments, no. Advocated clever questioning of the opponents to disprove. He doesn't talk about disproving anything. Socratic method disproves arguments by finding exceptions to them. So number one cannot be correct. 
The next one is fundamental, you see, property of language he's talking about. Uh, Wittgenstein is a philosopher, you see. What is the context and what is the dictionary meaning? You see, that is the main point he's arguing about in the entire passage. What is the currency of meaning? How they are using the word? What is the use of the word? Is the dictionary definition, is it derived from the context? Or it's the other way around that you look into the dictionary and then you use the word. So if you uh, go through the entire passage, uh, you will find that number three is the best summary. Meaning is dynamic. Definitions are static. Now, what, is, what do you mean by definitions are static? He is referring to the definitions given in the dictionary. Meaning is dynamic. Why meaning? Because we make use of words in context. The meaning in use theory helps us understand the definition of words are culled from their meaning. How we use the word on the basis of that, the dictionary defines them. It's not the other way around. The dictionary came into being later, you see. Language was in use before that. Are culled from their meaning in exchange and use and not vice versa. It's not the other way around. Uh, that is the main point he wants to point out here. So the answer is number three. Now we have here five sentences related to a topic. And you have to point out the odd one out. Although we are born with the gift of language, etc. And then we talk more than we need to, ignoring the effect we are having. We listen poorly. Now, all these things are about the gift of language. How we answer. What is the context? We talk more than we need. We have got all these things. The only odd sentence out is number two. We must carefully orchestrate our speech if we want to achieve our goals and bring our dreams to fruition. We are not talking about that. He's just talking about the gift of language. Choice of words, you see. The emotions we want to express you see and sometimes we don't even bother about the emotions we are oblivious of those emotions you see we just uh, speak on let us look at the next one wimbledon's greatest illusion is the sense of timelessness it evokes. without time means something which is uh, seems to be eternal something which seems to be immortal it is not controlled by materialism not controlled by time if you read all these sentences the one sentence uh, that doesn't work out here well is once he had survived the opening week the second week witnessed the range of arrested federalist genius uh, this is pointing to time you see in in order to keep uh, to the timelessness, we uh, don't uh, want number four to be there because it talks about the limitation of time, the regimentation of time, the opening week and the second week. And the uh, last one, you have those geometric symbols. If you look carefully, number two and number five have to do with the choice of the commonwealth bank logo and number three talks about the logos with hidden shapes etc and then number four about the graphic designers cryptic references that add story to the brand so the one that is out is those geometrical symbols and aerodynamic swooshes are more than just skin deep. And now what's the point in having aerodynamic swooshes? Uh, swooshes is the sound of a wind that is relieved, suppressed, placed, squeezed out. So uh, this doesn't have any relationship to the rest of the four sentences. So number one is the odd one out. Number one is the correct answer.